up. So sometimes you can make it more like for boys. You can uh, edit the bass on it. Right, right. Yeah. Inshallah. Inshallah. So, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Everyone, inshallah, today we're going to continue what we have been doing for quite a while now, but let's just look at it. We're in Surat al Nisa, Surat al Nisa, and yesterday we went in details in regards to justice, what that means, and all the different things that relate to justice. And of course, we also went into speaking about the sources of justice, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu And certainly we went into details about who is Wali al-Amr, who's the person in leadership and who would be the person that we would consider as a person that we must obey. And of course, to make the story short, we said the condition for the person for us to obey was basically that this person himself or herself, they basically abide or at least order by the order of Allah subhanahu wa So if this person were to give an order that contradicts the order of Allah subhanahu wa then we would basically not follow them. And there was actually an incident uh, where the Prophet had sent a group of Sahaba and when he sent this group of Sahaba, this leader, he basically told them to collect wood. They collected the wood. Then he said, start out the fire. They started the fire. And then he said, well, now jump into the fire. Doesn't the Prophet order, order you and tell you that you have to obey me? Jump into the fire. That's when one of them said, well, no, we actually obeyed the Prophet Sallam and believed in the Prophet Sallam to get out of the fire, not to go in it. So they basically rejected his orders, went to complain to the Prophet Sallam that this leader, this is what actually happened. And the Prophet Sallam said, if you had obeyed him, you would not have gone out of the hellfire or the fire, basically. In other words, you had then basically doomed and deemed yourself to that consequence you misunderstood what it means to obey the leader and that's the same thing so to actually engage in an injustice by whether it's being a police officer or whether an investigator whatever it is and you are supporting a dictator or an injustice leader of any sort then in that situation you would actually be held accountable for the same exact um, injustice that the main leader is causing so that's the same thing when we're talking about whether it's joining the army or whether we're talking about joining I guess um, being a police officer, being part of some kind of an intelligence group, et cetera. And in that situation, it really takes the same ruling. So if we're talking about, well, is it permissible for us to join an army, whatever country for whatever country it is, that's going to be determined. Is that army and is that country defending justice or not? If it's not defending justice, then in that situation, regardless of the privileges that you're taking, that does not justify the injustice. You might say, well, I'm basically not a politician. I'm here just basically um, implementing the orders that were granted to me or that were given to me to do a particular mission. I'm not a politician. That's not what I was instructed to do. And my duty ends at following this leader's or this military officer's um, orders. So in Islam, there's no one and nobody can actually say, well, I'm here just following blindly some kind of a leader to actually think that someone else is thinking for you and letting some other leader think for you and commit atrocities, commit injustices, this is going to be something that that person 
is held accountable for even if they didn't actually join the per that particular battle within that field, within that field of, let's just say they're going to Afghanistan, for example, but this person, their duty was in Ukraine, all right? Whether it's a Muslim or not Muslim, you don't actually join any army that's committing an injustice, whether that was in Ukraine or whether that was in, in Somalia or whatever country it is. At the end of the day, if that country is defending injustice anywhere in the world, then that means you're enhancing that power. Then in that situation, you are considered as one of those people that are supporting injustice and that are um, and those people that are making this whole, whether it's an army, country, nation, union, whatever it is, actually perform and be strong in your name as well. All right, so I'm not going to go in details about that. So in that situation, whether even if that's a Muslim army, what do I mean by if it's a Muslim army, even if this army was called the army for Sisi or the army for uh, uh, Muhammad ibn Salman or some Muslim name, all right? Or maybe Amir al-Mu'mineen in, in Morocco. So at the end of the day, if they're committing an injustice, you cannot say he's a Muslim leader. Even if it's a Muslim leader, if he orders you to commit an injustice, whether it's a Muslim leader or a non-Muslim leader, it's actually the same. You cannot support injustice. So basically telling you that the references that you go back to in defining right, wrong, in defining morality, all of that is basically going to be something that is going to determine your faith. So if you are basically right there believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and judgment day, then you have to be somebody that abides by or considers going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and considering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallam to be in your reference. We talked about it. Now here's the other thing. Alam tara ila ladina yazrumuna annahum bima there's actually a story behind this ayah. The story goes as follows. So a man and, well, a munafiq, supposedly a Muslim, he basically went in a dispute with a Jewish man over some kind of a some kind of money. So the Jewish man and this Muslim man slash Munafiq, they basically said, well, you know, let's basically go to someone to make a final judgment in this regard to end our um, to end our are at least argument. The Jewish guy said that he wanted to go to the Prophet and the Muslim slash Munafiq guy, he actually said he wanted to go to Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, who is actually one of the leaders of the Yahud. And the reason why he wanted to go to him was because he would be able to bribe him. So he was really seeking someone to bribe. He was really seeking a different solution. He was seeking a way to manipulate or even force the judgment or the final trial to be at his, at, at, basically on his side. So that's when this ayah was revealed. 
Alam tara ila ladina yazrumuna. Do you see those that would, the word yazrumuna means they would claim. So do you see those that would claim that they had believed in what you, what was revealed onto you and what was revealed onto the prophets before you? And then, well, they attempt to go and seek trial to Atahut. To Atahut, we're going to talk about this one. When they were ordered to deny them, when they were ordered to reject them, and the shaitan seeks to basically get them in a delusion that is far, a, a very far type of delusion. So wait a minute, a couple of things here. So basically this ayah was number one, starting out with the ayah alam tara. Let's see. So we said alam tara, we did this, uh, the word alam tara before. Let's go into it right there. And we said, alam tara, it doesn't necessarily mean, do you not see? So alam tara is to let the person recognize, even mentally, recognize the patterns of things, recognize to see the lesson learned. So those that would claim to be believers. So again, so here's the question, if it's to say claim to be believers, let, let's look at, we've got, this area is page 97. We're just going to run really quick. Remember page 97. I'm just going to go, oh, wow, subhanAllah. It actually opened exactly the page that I wanted. I would not have been able to do this. <laughs> it wasn't perfect. Okay, so let's see this area. So this area, you could see Surah Al-Hujurat. And let's see, so aya, Surah Al-Hujurat, ayah number 14. So it says, Qalati al-A'rabu amanna. So it was a group of A'rab, and when we say A'rab, we're actually talking about, well, some sort of Bedouins, okay? So in other words, they're not part of those that grew up in a residential, or let's call it an, some sort of social skills they definitely lack. Anyhow, so they said, Amanna. They used the word, we believed. And the ayah says, He said, D tell them you are not believers, rather you had become Muslim. For faith yet did not enter your hearts. And if you were to obey Allah and his messenger, the Lord Almighty would not neglect or disregard any of your good actions. For the Lord Almighty is all forgiving and all merciful. The true believers, innama al mu'minun. So innama is adatul hasab, basically telling you that this is... Um, this is basically uh, putting in that meaning it is defining that the believers would be the ones to believe in the Lord Almighty, the prophet, and look at this one, and then later they didn't hesitate. Well, that's not enough because they also have to invest. So they basically had invested their money, their life, for the sake of the Lord Almighty, those are the true, honest ones. So then they basically said, well, I mean, hey, we know what's in our hearts. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Do you, are you really teaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about your faith when the Lord Almighty, okay, when the Lord Almighty knows what is in the heavens and what is on earth and the Lord Almighty is all knowing? So the bay, they, then they went and said, well, hey, we're actually helping you. We're addition to the Muslim community. So the least that the least is that you could recognize us and recognize that we're an addition to your community, et cetera. So then the ayah says, yeah, they're actually bragging to you that they had become Muslim. Tell them, do you, are you really bragging about your Islam? But the true gratitude is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that had given you the hidayah or the guidance. If you really understand and if you were truly believers, you would recognize 
that the true gratitude and the one that actually deserves to be praised here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving you guidance. For the Lord Almighty is all knowing of all the unseen and the heavens and the earth. And the Lord Almighty is all seen in what you would commit. Now, what I, the reason why I wanted to get to this ayah was really because of the part in where it's telling you here that the true believers, number one, believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophet, two, they are not hesitant. In other words, they're really firm in in their faith on in their faith on the inside so it's not that they're somehow um taking these moments they're not really sure they're today yes tomorrow we're not sure taking all these different different um stances in where their even actions are contradicting what they claim to be and then that would actually be a munafa Let's go back to, well, we're, let's look at it really quick before we need to come back to it. And that's why you could see that this area is obviously differentiating between a person that is in a state of Iman and between a person that is in a state of Nifaq or hypocrisy. And those are two different things. But the question is, did the area actually call them Munafiqeen? At least these Arab. It didn't directly call them munafiqeen, but it was certainly asking them to use the word aslamna rather than a person than a person that is a true believer, because a true believer would actually have their iman penetrate their hearts. That's what a true believer is. So then, in that situation. I guess I'm finding myself really needing to go and look into, well, what is the description of a munafiq? Let's see right there. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا إِلَى مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ وَإِلَى الرَّسُولُ رَأَيْتَ الْمُنَافِقِينَ يَصُدُّونَ عَنْكَ الصُّدُودَ And of course, here it is again. And if they were invited to basically come to what the prophet what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed and come to the prophet peace be upon him you would see that the hypocrites would turn away and you could see right there yes sududa and of course this this type in the in where it is it is to emphasize the real and true behavior of that person so they would turn away and they would not be hesitant in turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet. And if a calamity were to happen as a result of something that they had committed, and then they would come and start swearing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the real motivation, the real um, attempt were the real reason why they chose other than the Prophet Sallam or Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's um, basically principle is because ihsanan wa tawfiqa. They just meant good. They just wanted to actually get to a good result. They didn't mean to harm anybody. So that's exactly the same thing. In where they created a narrative, thinking that that it's an issue of well, I know you basically ruled in such and such principle but our real motive is really to be good and is really to help the community we just wanted tawfiqa. we just wanted to bring about a reconciliation we wanted to um put in <clears throat> and bring in good within the community. We wanted to actually bring in um, some sort of a good uh, a good presentation, etc. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yalamullahu ma fi The Lord Almighty knows exactly what is in their hearts. So in that situation for these people, semicolon right here, fa'arad anhum. The way that I want you to re relate to these people, just turn away, and give them, the, here goes that word, again, 
the kind word again, just give them a reminder, a good reminder. Remember yesterday we went into the word mawrida and we went in detail of what that actually meant. And give them influential words that will affect their hearts. In other words, you're doing a multiple number of things. We're going to get there in just a bit. And but we're I'm just here giving you basically just an overview of hopefully from this area up until this area of what we're actually doing. But in order to get to a number of different things, I think we have to scrutinize, uh, scrutinize some words. And that's why we give you an overview. Number one is that يَتَحَكَمُ إِلَى الطَّغُوتِ what is tahut? So tahut comes from the word tara, and tara actually means to exceed the limit. So here they would go and seek justice through a tahut. In other words, a person that exceeds the limit, exceeds the limit. So that would mean that anything that is one. Now remember, tawhid actually stands on three different things. Number one, Tawheed stands in faith in the Lord Almighty's existence, the deity as him being the only deity. Number two, worshiping the Lord Almighty with the comprehensive meaning of worship to mean more than just a ritual. And number three, believing in the Lord Almighty in all the names and attributes that they're only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not associate any partners um, with the names or at least with the descriptions as well. So they're only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let me go for the second piece of it, which basically is relating the way that we would understand worship, because worship extends more than just ritual, because it, it also includes how you embrace and what you, you embrace in the definitions or at least the definitions that would define morality, define justice, and therefore to actually take any leader, okay? Take any leader, so that's number one, taking any deity take, or believing in any type of uh, thing or someone to holding the power or holding at least uh, the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or holding the, the position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would actually be considered ta'ut, okay? And this is extremely important because it is actually, it is actually helping you understand what it means to be a person of tawheed. Uh, that's important. So for a person that takes a certain leader, okay, takes a certain leader that's committing an injustice and considering these people as basically the ones that would define the principles of the Lord Almighty and they would alternate the real definition of what the words are really meaning or what the the definition of justice is really meaning that would actually be a tahut. So if we're talking about all a lot of these leaders, it's really sad, believe it or not. It's so sad to actually see a lot of Muslims actually manipulated and they would use the word tikfiri to describe the words that I'm saying. And this is simple tawheed. This is real. They'll call me takfiri because I simply defined what the books of tawheed would actually say. The books of tawheed would, look at this, it's the ayah. It's not me making this up. It's the ayah telling you everything that goes to ruling by other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ta'ud. It's that simple. It's Tahut. And that's why you did not ayata hakamu. They were seeking to basically get a fair or so-called quote unquote a trial. All right, to by going to a tahut. So anybody that rules other than by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ruled by is considered a tahut. 
it Tawhut is not necessarily not necessarily supposed to be only if we're going to an idol. Tawhut, because you don't go to an idol to somehow make a fair trial. They all know that. That's why they'll have priests. So whether that was a priest or whether that was a politician or whether that was a military force or whether that was some kind of a court or a system or whatever it is, it's going to be considered Tawhut. And this is Tawhut right here. They'll call you Tikhini. They can use all these names. You'll be like, well, I know one thing for sure is that it's basically the definition of the A. In where you know, that's is- really scary because when somebody makes takfir on somebody, is it based on the hadith about if somebody accuses somebody, doesn't it fall on one of them? Well, absolutely. absolutely. That's scary. That's scary. It- it's really sad how many, be- many because of their jahil, really, that's why they would fall in these confusions. You know, they would fall in these confusions because they didn't actually understand their religion properly. When you don't understand your religion properly, you could, you could easily, you could easily fall in these areas and actually think, well, I'm here, you know, putting my religion in place. When in reality, what you had actually done is fall in a manipulation. You basically went into adalalan ba'ida. By falling in adalalan ba'ida, well, then in that situation, you are really going to hold yourself accountable for this. You're going to have to recognize that shaitan can play a game on you and you're going to find yourself really supporting all that manipulation. You're going to find yourself putting your, you're going to find yourself really supporting Baldly. It's, it's quite sad really to, to see all of this all the time. But at the end of the day, you know, we're here trying to learn inshallah and hopefully we can inshallah learn our Islam in order to make sure that we're not supporting injustice, we're not committing um, you know, some form of shirk without us realizing. So we would basically have to make sure that we're, uh, we're understanding our deen right. I put a, uh, Nura, can you, can you say something again? Just say salamu alaikum or something. I, salamu alaikum. Oh, it's not working right. Let's do it again. What? Salam alaikum. Well, thought I would put a uh, Bluetooth to get this into my device. That that well, might mess up the sound, honestly. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. So what it did is take out. Okay. It basically removed device. Okay. I'm gonna go. Okay, let's see. Okay. Oh, you could still hear me right, right? Um yeah, I think so. Okay, good. So what I it, it, it is low. Is, is it low? Yeah. Oh boy, what did I do then? How about now? That's better. That's better. Okay. So what I decided to do was, well, if this is talking about the munafiqeen, then what we should do is, what are the different areas? Because we need to make sure that we're not actually munafiqeen ourselves. Well, it's important to know that nifaq is two different kinds. So I want to share first one screen. Let's see. So you got two different kinds of nifaq. You got the major nifaq. You got the major hypocrisy. Remember the word nifaq actually means hypocrisy. So you've got the major nifaq or the major hypocrisy would be a person that would reveal that about their faith that they're actually Muslim. And in reality, what they're really hiding is a form of hypocrisy. Well, what they're really concealing is that they don't really believe in Islam. So in that situation, this person, let's see, Georgiani said that this person basically, basically reveal, basically hides 
kufur or disbelief in their heart and then they would show faith in their appearance and of course the person whether they were denials uh, whether they were denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels, the books, or the messenger, or judgment day, then in that situation, they're basically hypocrites because they would be considered as committing a major nifaq. And this is what was actually referred to in the ayah in Surah An-Nisa, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, are basically at the lowest end in hellfire. So, nasallaha al wa al-afiyah. Yet, there is a type of two or a type two kind of nifaq in where it's called the nifaq al-asgar. It's the lower type of hypocrisy in where it is also called the action or at least the behavioral type of hypocrisy. The behavioral type of hypocrisy would mean that they would basically reveal as if they're doing a good action, a good, a good behavior, when in reality, what they're concealing is really the true motive and the true intention of what they're doing. In other words, or their behavior would not necessarily be abiding with their true faith. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ had actually mentioned in this hadith, you could see this hadith is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. So what did the, what did the Prophet ﷺ actually say? He said, there are four descriptions. If they're in, in a person, then this person is a complete and an ultimate that is an absolute munafiq. And whoever has any of these descriptions in that person, then that actually means they have a description of hypocrisy until they would abandon or leave that behavior. One. If they're trusted, they would betray. If they were to speak, they would lie. If they would make a trust or at least an agreement, they would basically betray that person. And when they go into a dispute, they would deny all your rights. Look at that in the Khasama Fajr. In other words, they'll use all the methods. They'll use all the methods to basically show their not only hatred, their animosity, they won't even abide by a particular principle whatsoever. This is probably the most common right now and the least spoken about. What is Ida Khasa Mufajar? Let's say put two people are friends. Two people are friends and of course, um, they have a lot of information about each other. So once they go into a dispute or basically um, in a disagreement about something, then the munafil would basically give themselves the justification that this person is a munafiq, therefore they don't have the right. Of course, they'll basically accuse the other person of being a munafiq, and therefore they'll give themselves the justification that they don't have to conceal their privacy. They, they can basically harm them in each and every single situation and every single way. Talk about them, talk about the, you know, the, the different private things that this person had shared with that other person and probably engage in different ways to harm the other person, whether probably talking about their bank accounts or probably their private life or using different methods to um, basically harm that other person because right now they went into a dispute. So basically their money, their life, their mental health, their their dean becomes to them a place of target. Now, this is really common. This is extremely common, unfortunately, within even the Muslim community. When they're in dispute with someone, uh, they, they basically put their dean, the other person's dean, the other person's life, the other person's mental health, the other person's family, his reputation, the other person's wealth. It becomes really haram. It becomes 
basically their place of target and therefore not to be respected in any way. Whatever game works, whatever card wins, you basically use and you start attacking that person and finding different ways to retaliate against that person. This is basically an attribute of nifaq. Um, the other piece, inshallah, we're going to continue. So when we're looking at uh, other descriptions in where, let's say, the Prophet in another hadith, the Prophet did actually say something similar. And he said, the ayatul munafiqi thalath. Well, not the ayah, but ayatul munafiqi thalath. The descriptions of a hypocrite are basically three descriptions. And he really said, said the same thing. You could see this one's actually qabakara at-tirmidhi ghayrahu. Uh, so basically uh, similar descriptions in where if they were to speak, they would lie. If they were to promise, they would be, uh, well, basically break their promise. And if they were trusted, they would betray. So at the end of the day is that this would basically be uh, a behavior of a munafiq, a behavior of a munafiq. And you could see, uh, let's see what Shaykh al Islam actually means, Ibn Taymiyyah. And it's really sad how right now we're seeing a lot of people attack this important scholar, at, literally attack him. And, and his books speak of a great person, of a great scholar, in fact, a genius. But then you would have some people right now, you know, once people confuse their important figures and their scholars and they become so fanatic in really losing, losing, I would say these beacons and not benefiting from these beacons and denying that they were important figures, whether it's in Noah or whether it's right there, it, um, it's Ibn Taymiyyah, et cetera. And then they would basically start attacking them. That it's, it's really sad. You know, the second that you would start attacking a beacon, then know you're basically hanging on to shaitan, hanging on to shaitan and delusion. Oh, I'm fine. All right. So let's say, quote, he said, hypocrisy is basically attributed generally, of course, that is um, an so basically on the major hypocrisy, which basically means concealing, concealing kufr or concealing disbelief. Yet as for the minor uh, hypocrisy, which basically would be in where you would have disparities between what you publicly would announce and certainly what you had concealed whether in we're talking about, of course, the obligations and in other words, behavioral, behavioral practices. And he said, that's what was actually described and that's what reflects this, what the, this hadith reflects and where the behavior is basically contradicting the truth of what they actually have in what they actually have in their heart. In other words, they could actually be believers in their hearts, but why would your behavior contradict what your heart really believes in? All right, let's see another one. Al Hafid ibn Rajab. By the way, Al Hafid ibn Rajab is also he's actually he's actually you know one of Ibn Taymiyyah's friends, but he actually died at forty five years old. Can you believe it? A great Hanbali scholar. Let's see. So he said, and most of the scholars had actually considered that hypocrisy in, well, literally, as a form of uh, a form of betrayal, a form of basically, uh, well, you're sneaking, you're betraying, and it's basically to reveal what is good and in reality hiding <clears throat> other than what you're really doing. In other words, it's a it's hypocrisy. So this is literally, that's what it means. And then he basically goes and explains that there it's two kinds. So you've got the kind that is the major kind, the, the major hypocrisy in where the person would basically reveal <clears throat> or claim that they're believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels, etc. But in reality, they're actually concealing what contradicts such belief that they are here revealing. And of course, that was the most of the hypocrisy during the time of the Prophet. 
And that's what the Quran had actually revealed in, of course, in speaking and rebuking these people and even talking about that they're not Muslim. So the ayah that we just did earlier, that was not necessarily speaking about these people, but that was actually speaking about Nifaq al Asmat right there. All right, so let's go for the other part. Well, if this is a, an, an ifaq, the question is, what are the descriptions of a munafiq according to the Quran and Sunnah? Because we definitely don't want to be part of that. Now, remember, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he used to run after Hudayf ibn al-Yaman. So who is Hudayf ibn al-Yaman? So Hudayf ibn al-Yaman was a Sahabi that the Prophet ﷺ had given him a number of different information, by the way. Number one, he basically had the most information regarding fitan or different signs of judgment day. And another thing is that Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, I guess his way of thinking about matters was completely different than all the other Sahaba. I named my son Hudayfa because of them, because of how much I love Hudayfa, Hudayfa ibn Yaman. A very honest person. Alhamdulillah, my son Hudayfa, mashallah, I mean, he's autistic, but uh, a very genuine, and a, a truly genuine person. Truly genuine person. Anyhow, um, alhamdulillah, on the spectrum, not severe autism. Anyhow, but, um, <clears throat> Hudayf ibn al-Yaman used to say, I, everyone would ask about the evil thing, uh, the good things that would lead to Jannah, but I used to ask about the evil things. And he said, مخافت أن أدركها or أن تدركني. Okay. He said, I used to ask about the evil things, not because he was seeking ways to do the evil things, but he was wanting to make sure that he's not doing an evil thing and therefore he could guarantee that he's doing the right thing. All right, so he was using, using a, different, uh, a, a different logic here. Let's see what else. Well, the Prophet ﷺ had given Hudayf ibn al-Yaman the names of all the hypocrites. Umar ibn Khattab would follow Hudayf ibn al-Yaman from one place to another just asking him, am I part of the Munafiqeen or not? But the Prophet ﷺ had told Hudayf ibn al-Yaman to keep the names private. So Umar ibn al-Khattab, whenever someone would die, he would go to Hudayf ibn al-Yaman and actually see whether Hudayf ibn al-Yaman is praying Salat al-Janazah and joining Salat al-Janazah on that particular person because if Hudayf ibn al-Yaman is not present, the chances are is that he knew that this person was actually a nephew. <clears throat> so Umar ibn Khattab would follow Hudayf ibn al-Yaman asking him if he is actually part of the Munafiqeen since the Prophet had given him the names of every single Munafiq in Medina. And Hudayf ibn al-Yaman would stay silent until at the end, he would not leave him alone. So that's when Hudayf ibn al-Yaman said, you're not part of them. That's the least. You're not part of them. And subhanAllah, and, Ya Allah, you know, if Umar al-Khattab could actually be so afraid that he's probably a munafiq, we really need to know, are we having the descriptions of munafiqeen? It's so scary. Well, let's look at it. Let's see. Abu Darda, let's see this one. Abu Darda, every time he would finish his tashahud in salah, he would basically seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from hypocrisy. And then one time, a guy came to him and said, what's up or what is wrong, Abu Darda? You and hypocrisy. It's like you're always connecting yourself with hypocrisy. What is wrong? What's What's that? Explain it to me. And he said, He said, just, you know, it's like, just give me my space. 
but by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> this is an oath that the man can actually change, his heart actually change away from the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in just an hour. In other words, it's like saying in an instant, instant. And then, in the religion, all of a sudden, just departs their heart. It, and just without us actually recognize it. Let's see, Ibn Abi Mulaika, he basically said, أَدْرَتُ ثَلَاثِينَ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ رَسُولِ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ كُلُّهُمْ يَخَافُ النِّفَاقَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ مَا مِنْهُمْ أَحَدٌ يَقُولُ إِنَّهُ عَلَى إِمَانُ جِبْرِيلَ وَمِكَائِيلَ And this is actually narrated by Bukhari. He said, I basically had seen, in other words, I lived with around 30 of the Prophet's companions, and all of them were fearful that they might actually be hypocrites. And none of them had at all guaranteed and said that they were at the faith of Jibreel, the angel Jibreel, or angel Mikael. Ibn al-Qayyim, a great important scholar, um, who was also the student of Ibn Taymiyyah. He said, Tallahi laqad muli'at qulubu al-qawm imanan wa yaqeena wa khawfuhum min al-nifaq shadeed wa hammuhum lidhalika thaqeel wa siwahum kathirun minhum la yujawzu imanuhum hanajiruhum wa hum yadda'una anna imanuhum ka imanu jibreel wa mika'id. He said, by Allah, their hearts were filled with faith. The faith in where it was not at all in, in any hesitance. It was certain faith. But their fear and their fear of uh, of hypocrisy was out was so was was outstanding, and that was considered this this issue that was burdening them. Yet many many other than them, where iman is not even going up to their throats. Yet at the same time, they would claim to be having the faith of Jibreel and Mikael. Now, this is actually very scary because what, what nifaq and what hypocrisy really entails, it's basically a certain disease in the heart. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ بِمَا كَانْ يَكْذِبُونَ What is actually in their hearts is nothing but a disease. And then this disease would basically start spreading in their body. And then eventually they would basically have a, 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 a painful, basically, punishment on judgment day. نَسَ اللَّهَ الْعَفْوَ الْعَافِيَةِ And he said, right there when you're looking at the main reason behind that, even Al-Qayyim explains, and he said it was really because their own intention and their own, uh, their their own, uh, well, not only intention, but their own will is really what had affected and influenced their hearts. They basically were uh, exposed to the different shubuhat. It did, remember, shubuhat and shahwat, we did that yesterday. We talked about the misconceptions. We also talked about the lusts. And we said that those two reasons are really what influence people's faith. And here we go. He's bringing it up right there in where it's basically exposed, whether we're talking about misconceptions, desires, and then basically goes into their hearts. And then it basically disrupts and it disrupts their faith. It contaminates their faith. And then it starts overcoming their intentions. It overcomes their will. It overcomes their intentions and that baby contaminates it completely. Now, that's why it's important to actually go in details in understanding, well, what are the descriptions for munafiqeen? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us have any of these descriptions. The first one is a tama al-shahwani. What does that mean? Although, yes, this ayah uh, was actually referring, well, speaking about the Prophet's wives and also the believing women and why they needed to wear hijab was really because the hypocrites were basically not minding their business. They're not respecting. They're not respecting the principles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually said, basically, fi qalbihi marad. Let's say, so a tama shahwani would basically mean that they don't put a stop and an end 
to their lust. So they keep going. They don't stop. They're, they started on cigarettes, then they're now going to weed, and now they're going to probably different kinds of drugs. They don't know how to stop. They don't know how to put an end to it. That actually reveals that the person, if you're not putting a stop to your inclination, that actually means that you are not considering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's principle, you're not considering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's powers. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fayat wa ma'alla di fi qalbi marad. And fala takhdana bil qawl. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was ordering the female sahabiyat, of course, he was ordering them when they speak that they would use a voice of uh, a voice of seriousness, a voice without having any form of khudur, in other words, not a feminine voice, but a, and it doesn't mean using a masculine voice by all means, but it basically means that you're not trying to be lenient in your voices. And therefore, and of course the A says, in other words, say what is good and using a good method. So don't change your voice in order to attract, um, uh, attract others. Because the chances are the hypocrites that have an illness in their heart, they'll basically have a tama. What is a tama? It tama basically means take advantage. Okay. So they'll take advantage of the different areas that to them might actually be a place of temptation. And they'll start taking advantage of those different areas because they don't know how to put a stop to their own, um, to their to their own. Um, basically behavior. They don't know how to stop themselves. They'll continue. Why don't they know how to stop themselves? They don't know how to stop themselves because Iman, remember the ayah said with the ayah that we did in Surah Al-Hajarat, and um, the faith did not yet enter your hearts. And of course, if the person is falling in this type of, whether we're speaking about misconception, shubha, or whether we're talking about shahwa, remember we talked about it yesterday, then in that situation, the more that, the more the heart absorbs of the misconceptions or whether the lust, the more they would find themselves really away from an iman and away from the actions of a mu'min. And they'll find themselves really absorbing kufur, absorbing hypocrisy, absorbing doubt, and absorbing certainly different innovations. And they're all different illnesses um, that basically would lead the person into what is probably going to be within a misconception. So all these different types of uh, wrongdoing. Remember, an imanu yazidu ayankus. This isn't a hadith, but it was actually said by the scholars because it reflects what the Quran and the Sunnah were teaching. And Iman Yazidu Ayankus, Yazidu Bata and Qusabil Masiyah. Faith increases and decreases. It basically increases with obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it would decrease, faith would decrease bil masiyah with more with more sin committed. So what that means is that the more you would delve in the wrong behavior, the more it would actually affect your heart. So wait a minute, is it the heart that's affecting the behavior or is it the behavior that's affecting the heart? It's basically both affecting each other. So if your surroundings, if your behavior is basically going into, other than the principle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's going to get you farther and get you get your get your heart farther away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're gonna find yourself little by little from going into the level of shahawat or lust to then finding yourself in the field of shubuhat, in the field of misconceptions. At the same time, so shubuhat certainly it's within your mind, it's within your heart, and the shahawat is more within your actions, but they're they're not. They're not separable. They basically would feed one another. All right. And this is this is extremely important. Let's see this, the other description. Basically, arrogance, arrogance and pride. Let's see. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And if they were 
told, come over for the prophet, come to the prophet that is, in order to basically ask him for, to make dua for you. So istaghfir lakum Rasulullah would not that the prophet would forgive them, that the prophet would make the invocation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to basically pray for them, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would for, forgive them. What happens to the munafiqeen? So this is just to describe their behavior. They would, and it's a metaphor, definitely. They would turn their heads and then so this is the this is right there describing their behavior. They would turn their heads, but it's not, it's not necessarily that they would have to turn their heads, but this is a metaphor to describe their behavior. And it's basically to describe the behavior, and the behavior is basically describing the, the behavior is basically describing their intention what this really reflects it's a type of pride it's a type of pride it's re really revealing the person's arrogance and you would see them basically turning others away from the prophet and from islam and they would be in complete arrogance. Uh, let's continue talking about that because this is this is the most common illness that we're living in today. That word, they'd be the ones to turn people away from truth, away from the deen. And then not only did they turn away, but they'll also start mocking the scholars, start mocking anything that relates to Islam, maybe mocking niqabis, or maybe mocking hijabis, or maybe mocking niqab, or maybe mocking um, the beard, or maybe mocking the scholars, or maybe mocking religious people in presenting themselves like they are the ones that are cool. They're not like these backwards people and they're actually different. They're, and what you really don't recognize is that they're actually wanting to fit in in the disbelievers clan. And just, I think there's an ayah that we really need to quote here. This ayah, let me, I, I, I need you all to see it, okay? I need you all to see it. Well, in, in, in Surat Ittawbah, the story is, is that they basically, the Munafiqeen, so it was the Battle of Tabuk, and then they started saying, why are, or the, those that are in the battle, in other words, those that were most, are at uh, least, or those that were basically um, the best in their Quranic memorization, they were the ones to actually be the most cowardice, they are the ones to eat the most, and they are the ones to basically They're the most cowardice whenever we're actually, um, let's say, let, let me, I'm just gonna make it um, so we can actually say it. Let's say, here we go. Let's say, look at this right there, so you could actually see it, okay? Um, let's go find another one. And here we go. Okay, here we go. This one's actually straightforward. Okay, here we go. So this area right there, let's say. The story is, here we go. One of the men from the Munafiqeen, this is um, this is Tafsir ibn Kathir. And they, they started saying, how can we see our reciters? In other words, these that are part of those that are considered the best of the Muslims. They're basically the ones to eat the most and they're basically the biggest liars and the most cowardice whenever it is come, co coming into having the major encounter at the battle. This was risen to the Prophet And then of course that man, they basically, went to the Prophet but already they basically said, we will just, we were just 
having fun. We didn't really mean anything with it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Abillahi wa ayatihi wa rasulihi kuntum tastahzi'un. We're really mocking. And what you're really mocking is really Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet peace be upon him, and of course the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And right there, that's this ayah, let's say Surah At-Tawbah, ayah 65 and 66, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quote said, وَلَا إِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ لَا يَقُولُنَّ إِنَّ مَا كُنَّا نَخُضُ وَنَلْعَبَ If you were to ask them, well, why would you say and mock the believers? Why would you mock them in such a way? And they said, um, and, and tell them that is what you were really mocking was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even the Prophet. That's what you were really mocking. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Don't even, you know, it, it doesn't mean see, don't seek forgiveness. But this is, in other words, don't claim to have a justification or give yourself a different narrative. The truth of the matter is that what you had done is really nothing but committing kufr. It is nothing but committing disbelief after having faith. Now, what does that mean? Well, what that means in what we're trying to get to is that even though they didn't actually mock the ayat, they didn't really mock Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they didn't mock the Prophet sallallahu but they actually mocked the believers. But they didn't mock the believers because of, you know, it was a personal issue. It wasn't a personal issue. It was really trying to mock their adherence to the different to the different practices within Islam. In other words, the truth of the matter is that they were really wanting to mock the believers because they considered themselves as part of the other side, the cafe side, and therefore they were mocking the believers, whether it's in their da'wah, whether it's in their, um, in their, uh, uh, in their uh, what they're wearing, for example, or whatever it is, just that, just you considering themselves yourself as part of the mushrikeen or those that are on the other side, you had actually then defined that you are part of the mafiqeen right there. Let's continue. So the there we go. There's the ayah. So yahdar al munafiqun an tunazil alayhim suratun tunabbiuhum bima fi qulubihim. Qul istahzi'u inna Allah mukhrijun ma tahdarun. So basically mocking the different ayat, mocking the believers, mocking those that are doing da'wah, mocking, and it's, it's, it's really sad. When they would sit around the believers, they'll say, yeah, we're actually part of you, we're believers, etc. And then when they're on their own, when they're basically joining with the other shayateen, joining with the other people and joining with those other, uh, the other people that are on the other side, basically fighting Islam and Muslims, they'll just say, well, we, we're really on your side, but we were just, we were just mocking, we're just having fun. We were just, uh, you know, just uh, get entertaining ourselves. And of course, this is important to, to look at, you know, because when the person finds themselves as they're actually part of a different group. And, and this is this is extremely important because many times certain people are just engaging in certain behaviors just to fit in, just to fit in. And the second that you just to fit in and find yourself really considering yourself as fitting in with the non-Muslim group, then you had really lost your Iman. Did the Prophet ﷺ get his feelings hurt? Well, absolutely, Nora. Absolutely. The Prophet ﷺ, many, many, many times his feelings were hurt. In fact, you know, I find that the wording of the question is kind of funny. That's why I'm laughing. The wording of the question is kind of funny um, because the Prophet ﷺ, and, and, and it's not funny, definitely. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from the munafiqeen, um, but the Prophet ﷺ was actually um, hurt many, many, many times. In fact, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in numerous ayat, because he was hurt, 
in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling him um, in, in, in numerous ayat was telling him, for example, in the ayah, um, uh, you are taking it too much on yourself. You are hurting yourself. You're going into deep anxiety. And he tells, he tells him, that you can't control them at the end of the day. You're just going to deliver the message. And in another ayah, where the Prophet was going to severe anxiety because of, because of the reaction from, uh, reactions from a lot of people. And, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, basically giving him this this support in where you just have to deliver the message and at the end of the day in where they have to make the choices and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would hold them accountable. Let's see, the other thing is infaq. Well, it's not just infaq, but they would turn people away not only from sp sponsoring for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or paying for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whether we're talking about donating, let's say, in the masajid or donating for a good cause, etc., or donating for the poor, um, they would basically they would basically turn people away from any good activity. So let's say we're doing some activity at the university. Um, well, this used to happen so many times when I was a chaplain. It's so sad to actually say that it was the Muslims. Wallahi lazim, this was real. You had the university was giving me platforms to do da'wah in the university. And it was actually the Muslims. The Muslims, wallahi lazim, it was the MSA. They were the ones that were canceling the events on me without even informing me. They would be the ones to call out that that event was canceled or this event was basically called out and etc. And even, believe it or not, this is real. So I was assigned to be the advisor for the MSA. All right. But the MSA went to my boss and asked that I would be basically um, uh, put down. In other words, basically... Um, uh, not included um, with the MSA, and instead they put a Buddhist advisor. <laughs> just to see that, just it's so sad how we can actually have the Muslims themselves, wallahi, acting, acting in favor of disbelief. When you could have sometimes the kufur, the kufar themselves might actually give you platforms, but you will find that the Muslims, wallahi, the Muslims, I found that the Muslims, wallahi, were a bigger burden. Our problem lies within. Wallahi, our problem lies within. The Muslim community yet has a lot to learn about what their faith means, what their union as a mu'mineen group, as a Muslim group, what that means. It is so sad that we're still here trying to make it harder, even on those that would act in, activi in activism for the sake of Islam. Let's see. So the munafiqeen, هم الذين يقولون لا يقولون لا تنفق على من عند رسول الله حتى ينفضوا ولا يغزاء السماوات والأرض so what happened is that, of course, you know, some people would be wanting to donate, they'll bring food. And when they're basically with the Prophet and what the Munafiqeen were saying, well, don't, you know, don't bring the food when they're with the Prophet um, because you're then bringing in more people and you're inviting in more people. So just wait until these people would go and just, limit your, your the amount of spending you're spending for the sake of da'wah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, you could say that they don't want to contribute in any khair. They don't want to contribute in any khair. They don't want to contribute in, in bringing in the good for the ummah. They don't want to contribute not in energy, not in time, and certainly not in money. Um, and you will find that in the munafiqeen. Let's see. And of course, 
attacking the believers as being stupid, as being naive, as being uneducated, as lacking qualification, and the list goes on and on, is the narrative that they will use in order to give themselves the justification, well, the reason why this scholar or that scholar or that woman, whatever it is, sheikh, sheikh, whatever it is, they'll basically say, well, that's because they're lacking knowledge. They don't have the way of giving dawah. They're boring. They're this. And they'll start doing the, what is called the ad hominem. All right. And here, let's say, Look at this. This is important. When they are told to believe as the other people had believed, and then they would say, are we going to be believing like those that are sufaha? So what did they do? Did they really, did they really accuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, they were actually accusing those that were in faith of being sufaha, of being naive, of being stupid, of lacking intelligence, or of being trivial, whatever it is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the truth of the matter, they are the ones that are too bad. They're the ones that are lacking the intelligence. And here's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defending the believers. But the truth of the matter, but you don't even recognize the, the reality of things. You created your own definition. You made a narrative. And then based on that delusion, you basically put the believers in a block that they had somehow that they lacked intelligence, they lacked uh, they, they lacked uh, wisdom, and the list goes on and on. And what happens is that uh, they would basically do muwalatil kafir. What would they do? They would attribute, they would consider themselves as part of the groups of il kafirin. Let's see, what does that mean? They would feel that they belong with the kuffar, they would, their hearts are with the kuffar, they would feel that they, and, and this is really important to mention because it's part of our instinct, okay? This can be really tricky. It's part of our instinct that we don't want to feel being part of those that are one, politically defeated, militarily defeated or even or even consider um the less successful let's just at least say it and what we are saying right now is that the muslims are basically the ones to right now economically be considered the poorest and of course education to actually be on the other side militarily to basically be the ones to colonize imperialism, eating all of us, and certainly politically, we're not the upper, uh, we're not the upper class right now. We're actually defeated in each and every single corner. And what happens oftentimes? What happens oftentimes is that you know it's part of our own psychology that we want to be part of those that are considered victorious. And it becomes a very tricky thing because for the munafiqeen, they don't necessarily look at what right now is defined as victorious. <clears throat> they would look into victory beyond today's definition and they would understand that what it means to be in victory is really in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you were to actually look at Musa and Fir'aun, Musa alayhi salam was considered the minority. His group was the minority. His group was definitely politically not on the side of the winning side. His, he was definitely not the upper a hand in military. Definitely in education as well. In education, well, Fir'aun was basically the person that had supported all the civilization that made um, ancient Egypt. And certainly he basically had the money. So economically, he basically had all the money. Not Musa, he said. He was actually considered 
well, the son of Imran, the son of um, a man that was considered a slave of Bani Israel. And <laughs> you, you see all that, all right? Minority. And certainly running away to basically preserve their deen. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was presenting them that they are the ones that are then even when the Bani Israel, when they were seeing that the Fir'aun was following, following them with his army, they basically had doubted whether they did the right thing or not. They took a moment. They said, Inna la mudrakun. That's it. They're gonna they're gonna get to us. We're defeated. When they were really running away for their faith. But then Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he stood up and said, Kalla, verily not, the Lord Almighty, inna ma'i rabbi sayahin. Verily, the Lord Almighty is with me. He'll be the one to give us guidance. And this is important. This is when faith speaks up. This is when faith speaks up in where, no, despite all the definitions during our times or do it, those that would define through the lens of dunya, they would define success, victory based on dunya terms. But a believer defines things based on Allah's Taala's terms. So the Prophet Musa Salim was actually teaching them. Kalla. What is kalla? Kalla verily not. Even though hey, it's really obvious. No, you're defeated. They, they just got to you. But he, with faith, said absolutely not. There's no way. If we're on the side of the lost part of the island, there's absolutely no way. Even though you actually see them right before your eyes, that they're about to reach you and actually arrest each and every single one of you right there but he said no there's no way why because Allah's Prana he was seeing things based on Allah's Prana terms and then he said Inna ma'ya rabbi. what is the vision of a believer Inna ma'ya rabbi. as long as I'm holding on to Allah's Prana that's all that's needed as long as I'm holding on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's the true victory. Inna ma'ya rabbi. That's it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with me. It doesn't matter. Yes, based on dunya terms, they're right there. This is a minority running away. Definitely didn't have the weapons. And even if they did, well, they, the, the army of the Pharaoh, they, they basically even described, they described, they called them shirdhimatun qaliloon. It's like, ah, oh, they're just, yeah, they're just a small minority, but hey, it's just a small gain, nothing to worry about. But we're still going to make sure that where they're, they don't get any at any time, somehow doubling in number and becoming a big number. But yeah, but here, even the Fir'aun actually called them Shirdima, Shirdima, just a small number. Really nothing, nothing that would endanger my kingdom and my power, but we still have to make sure that we, we put them under control. And here we go. Inna ma'i rabbi sayahdi. Sayahdi, in other words, the true guidance, the true victory is really where he leads us and takes us to the true guidance. That I'm not, I'm not worried about that. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala write them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the, the munafiqeen. As that Bashar Munafirina, but Nalahum Adab and Adima. And this is really, you know, the, uh, the Hakum would basically, you know, you're not bringing glad tidings, but this is more of a satire. Al Munafirin, bringing the Munafirin that, or bring them uh, some kind of a congratulate them that they're actually going to face uh, painful torments. Who are these? Those that would take the kafirin, the disbelievers, as their authority and instead of the mu'min. Now, this is important. 
And how do they relate with the mu'mineen? Well, they're basically a tarabbus. They're lurking at the believers. They're waiting for any harm to happen to them. They're really wanting them. Let's see. So, they lurk, they, they're just watching and just hopeful that the believers would basically not be successful. They're just waiting for that moment where they would see that whatever, whatever activity that they were doing is not going to work out. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those that would lurk at the believers or at you, and if you were to get a victory or a success from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would then say, well, we were with you. In other words, when it's coming to get the victory, they just want to get the victory. They just want to get the advantage of it. And if the basically the kafirin were the ones to be victorious in any way, or it's, it doesn't have to be victorious in a battle, but if they were to get an advantage in any way, they would basically say, We were basically on your side. We were just really protecting you from those believers. And this is this is a way of muhada. It's a way of betrayal. It's a way of hypocrisy. It's a way of it's oh, it's so painful. Sorry about that. I went through this a lot and where you would have, it's, it's so sad, stabbing you behind the back. Stabbing you behind the back. And, you know, when you're trying to do da'wah and then you'll have other people stabbing you in the back, just wanting you to fail, just wanting you to not be, and even wanting you to go into more and more hardships, and they'd be right there giving you these smiles, like they're with you, but in reality, they're just waiting for you to get, to get into this defeat, to get into more trouble. They're just, oh, Ya Allah. Al-Kasal fil ibadat basically they're really lazy in performing ibadah, in performing worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, munafiqina, sorry, inna al-munafiqina yukhadi'un Allah wa huwa khadi'uhum. Wa idha qamu ila salati qamu kusala, yuwa'una al-nasa wa la yithkuruna Allah illa qalila. Verily, the hypocrites would betray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be betrayed. So this is Basically, that there, this is their, uh, this is their attempt, and the Lord Almighty would betray them. It's not that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would betray them because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would not do anything evil, but the, it, things would appear murky in front of them. And then when they would stand up for prayer, they would stand up lazy. Yura'unanes. The reason why they would stand up was really to gain some kind of acceptance, some kind of a. Uh, some kind of a privilege that basically comes from appearing like they're on the believer side and they would barely mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would barely read Quran, barely do dhikr. And why? Because their hearts are concealing, their hearts are concealing nifaq, hypocrisy. Why? Because they're living in a taraddud, hesitance. You would see them hesitant, not part of the believers and not part of the, the kuffar. They, you could see they're two-faced and where they don't actually they don't actually have a specific identity. Their identity is always just camouflaged, really, in where they would be, they themselves wouldn't have a specific identity to be part of these and part of these people, they're camouflaged. And when they're with the believers, they would pretend to be part of them. And when they're with the disbelievers, they would basically start uh, start mocking uh, the, the believers. And most importantly, which is the A that we're doing, which basically means they would, they would consider ta'ud other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or those that are exceeding the limit in their transgression. That's basically the ayah that we're doing. 
let's see, Ibn al-Qayyim said, if you would take them to basically rule by what is apparent revelation, you would find them basically turning away. And if you were to basically call them to uh, by the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or even the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, they would basically turn away because they're not seeking to basically know the principle. They don't want the principle. They basically want something else. They want to put in their narrative. They're coming there to put themselves as beyond everything. And that's so scary. And he said, and what do they do? They're basically trying to break the ties between the, the disbelievers. They're causing divisions. And let's say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Law Haraju Fikum Meza Dukum Illa Habala, Wala Udaru Hilalakum, Yabuna Kumun Fitna, Wafikum Samaruna Lahum. Said if they were, and this was during the Battle of Hanay. Oh, sorry, Tabuk, not Hanay, Tabuk. All right, so during the Battle of Tabuk, one third of the army was actually hypocrites. So there were 30,000 going to face um, an organized troop or troops of 40,000 from the Byzantine Empire, or Irum. In the middle of the way, there was a dispute between somebody from Al-Aus and somebody from al Khazraj, basically, or sorry, not al Aus and Khazraj, but somebody from Al-Ansar and somebody from the Muhajiri. <clears throat> There's a dispute over the well, who's gonna be fetching the water first, Who's who actually went into um, getting the water first, uh, it's getting there first and all of that. And then, uh, of course, who wanted to abuse this dispute over who's going to get water first? It was none other but the leader of the Munafiqi, Ibn Sabi. He basically started saying, wanted to abuse and make use of that dispute in order to say, hey, all these immigrants, meaning the Sahaba and the Prophet Sallam, when they went into Medina, they basically caused us to basically regress in, uh, in our basically advancement. And they caused us to go into such division. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when these people, they, they, uh, the Munafiqeen, basically one third of the army. So they were 30,000, now one third of the army, about 10,000 actually go back to Medina when the Prophet was actually midway heading towards Jordan. Then the ayah was revealed. If they were to join you, they would just get you into a regression. They would slow you down. In other words, there are certain people, just don't bring them along because what they will do is slow the advancement, slow the process, and just basically put more and more hurdles along the way. And they would create more divisions. What they really seek is just more and more division, more and more failure. And unfortunately, some of you might actually listen to them. Some of you might actually give them more spaces to speak. There are certain people you don't want to give them whatsoever a place and a listening ear. You just have to, you just have to on the spot, just disregard them. And we're gonna see, um, we're gonna see that area and where it's basically that area where it's telling you, let's go back to that area for a second. Let's go back to this area where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually says, عنهم. For these people, you just got to turn away. They say good, kind words. Yes, absolutely. Still continue, you know, don't completely separate, but عنهم, but keep that line in where at least it's a reminder. Maybe their hearts will, will change. Maybe they will, you know, um, keep a word of good an eloquent word that would probably affect their heart but at the end of the day is that you just have to recognize that there are certain there are certain things that you really have to put a fine line because not every single addition within your activism is necessarily good 
there are certain additions that just slow you down. That's it. Al-half al-kathib, wal-khawf, wal-jubn, wal-hala. Basically, making oaths that are not true, they're lies. Fear, cowardice, panic. يَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُمْ لَمِنْكُمْ وَمَا هُمْ مِنْكُمْ وَلَكِنَّهُمْ قَوْمٌ يَفْرَقُونَ لَوْ يَجِدُونَ مَلْجَأً أَوْ مَغَارَاتٍ أَوْ مُدَّخَلًا لَوَلَّوْا إِلَيْهِ وَهُمْ يَجْمَحُونَ يَحْسَبُونَ كُلَّ صَيْحَةٍ عَلَيْهِمْ هُمُ الْعَدُوُ فَاحْذَرْهُمْ They would be living They would be living in complete fear And in any second They might be so afraid that, oh, what if we were to get defeated? What if they were to actually say this about us? What if I were to lose my job? What if I would not get the grades, etc.? So what do they do? They're always just panicking. They're afraid of their, they're afraid for their dunya. Everything. They might actually think, oh, it's coming at me. Oh, no, that's it. So Allah subhanahu wa says, humul adu. That's the enemy. So be careful. Why? Because they're extreme. They're extreme cowards. The other part, really scary. They like to be praised for doing things that they didn't actually do. Let's say, Abu Sa'id al Khudri, he actually said, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah. That's so scary. What is the story here? So a group of men from the munafiqin, the hypocrites, during the time of the Prophet when the Prophet went into basically the battle, they basically did not join along, which is the Battle of Tabuk. And they were basically so happy that they didn't join. It's like, hey, we made the right decision. You didn't actually get to the battle. You didn't actually get into We We knew that that wasn't going to work out. We knew that hey, we didn't get into putting in all the wasted energy that is. And when the Prophet came, they basically started putting in these different uh, these different reasons to why they couldn't join. And they started making all these different oaths. And they basically were so happy. Well, let me give you the story a little bit. So remember the, tabu, the, the battle of Tabuk, the one that we were just talking about when the Sahaba had, when the Prophet Sallam had basically um, heard and uh, had known that the Byzantine Empire had gathered an army of over 40,000 people, so near Jordan, okay? And they were, of course, you wouldn't gather an army unless you were attempting to do something. So it seemed that they were heading towards Medina because they had heard that the Muslims were right now um, growing in number. So the Byzantine Empire, being an empire, wanted to make sure that there wasn't going to be a future threat, so eliminating it when it's at birth. So the Prophet ﷺ orders every single man that is capable of fighting to join along the army. So the Muslims would gather 30,000 troops, okay? Some had the munafiqeen. They had stayed behind, stayed behind. And of course, when the Prophet ﷺ, uh, in the middle of the way, we just talked about the this dispute between the the Sahabi from the Ansar and even from the the, the Muhajiri over a well over the the well. One third of the army of the hypocrites goes back, but then in Medina, not only those hypocrites that went back were the only hypocrites, but there were other hypocrites as well. And those hypocrites, when the Prophet Sallam, yes, the army, the troop. The, from the Byzantine Empire, they didn't get to meet them. They basically fled. They basically ran away when they heard that the Muslims were coming at them. Okay? Now, 
when the Prophet went back since the army of the Byzantine Empire basically went away, when the Prophet came, uh, came back to Medina or went back to Medina, the Munafiqeen came to the Prophet and started giving excuses why they couldn't come. One was basically saying, well, you know, the women, the blonde women are too much of a, too big of a temptation to me. And the other one said, well, I basically got really sick. And the other one, oh, it was basically the time of harvest. And I needed to really harvest because I was really in need of money. And the list goes on and on in all these munafiqeen in what, um, in, in, in what they were basically trying to put in some kind of an excuse why they couldn't join the Prophet Sallam. And they, because of course there was no battle, so they basically wanted to get the price like we knew it. Yeah, we just made the right calculation. So they wanted to basically get praised for something, for something that they didn't really do. All right. So in that situation, Allah subhanahu wa said, well, don't, you don't think that those that would be so happy to be praised for something that they had not done. Don't think that they would be, um, that they would be bimafaza, that they would be protected from the torments. Let's give the other one. They would ridicule any good action. You know, all this relates to Aqidah. So what do they do? What is illams? Illams is to give a body gesture. This body gesture and what they were ridiculing and what they were really doing in terms of body gesture, which really is to condescend the believers, all right? And they're just فَيَسْخَرُونَ مِنْهُمْ سَخِرَ اللَّهُ مِنْهُمْ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ they would just ridicule the believers and the the oh even with body Allah. language what was that nura you said even with body language even with body language that the, the, uh -huh. yeah, the word zoom you know it's kind of like you're standing one place and then somebody else gives some kind of an i, eye I had that today it, absolutely <laughs> the restaurant yep yep give like an eye roll or probably a snap or probably raising the eyebrows, all of that, or, you know, just different body language. And the body language is really supposed to mean that this person is ridiculing the, the believers. It's, it, it's really sad. And notice that a lot of it has to do with how they feel that, or whose group they're actually feeling a part of. They're actually feeling part of the munafiqeen. They're part of the disbelievers. They're part of the kafirin. And they're feeling that the mu'minin are not basically part of their group. They don't feel they don't belong. They don't feel that they belong as, to, to the mu'minin at all. Let's see. Arruda bi asfar al Whenever you're trying to put, uh, or basically there is an action to basically support the ummah. إذا أنزلت سورة أن آمنوا بالله وجاهدوا مع رسوله استأذنك أول الطول منهم وقالوا ذرنا نكم مع القاعدين. So basically, whenever there is an opportunity to not be amongst that are amongst those that are doing an activity. Let's say, for example, you're doing an activity at the masjid. You're probably I don't know putting the food, uh, collecting the trash maybe cleaning the masjid or maybe doing the flyers, doing all that, they'd be the ones to basically just stick around, be there for the food, but not be there to pick up the trash, not be there to be part of those that are probably organizing the people. They'll be there when it's time to get some kind of bonus, not be there to do a job. So, or they'll basically want to be there when it's time for the photo shoot, that they were part of all these people that were doing um, or making this activity be possible and et cetera, but they were just there for the photo shoot. 
but were they really there and maybe sponsoring and money or maybe putting in uh, the work to probably clean the tables or maybe do the flyers or maybe invite people in or, you know, just any activity, any activity. No, but they'll be there for the photo shoot. They'll be there for, they'll be there for the bonus. Yeah, what bonus do I get? That's someone ethical. But you'll find them there. You'll find them there. Let's go to the other one. Right. We just we just got a couple more, okay? Al Amr bin Munkar wa Nahal wa Maruf. Basically, order from what is evil, and they would forbid what is good. And Allah subhanahu wa taala says, Al Munafiqun wa Al Munafiqat. The hypocrite men and the hypocrite women, they would basically support one another. What would they do? They would order for what is evil and what is wrong, and they were forbid what is good. And they would certainly hate jihad and mock those that would engage in any form, whether it's jihad, activism, in any way. And then they would be so happy that they're actually on the other side. And they would hate to join in jihad, whether in contributing for the sake of dawah or for the sake of good or even themselves and they would be the ones to say oh this is it's either that it's too hot or hey the muslims it's the muslims are always not so perfect in their eyes the muslims need to work harder and etc it's like okay you know what why don't you help us work harder if the masjid is not clean and it's so dirty well, can you help us collect the donations to make it clean? If the message to you are not having the best lighting, can you make it possible to bring the message the best lighting? If you see that the message are not organized, can you help us make them organized? If you see that their, their carpet is stinking, okay, fair enough. Can you collect the donations or at least make it possible? You you donate to make the message have the best carpet. If you're feeling that, oh, they're not doing enough for the youth. Well, can you bring about those are that are qualified to do something for the youth? Or if you're, but you know, some people they're just constantly just cursing the situations. Like the Muslims are this, the Muslims are this. And then they would give themselves, it's like, oh, well, you know, it's like the Muslims have to correct themselves, correct themselves in order to invite them in. Well, do you, don't you feel that you too, this is your home. The masjid is your home. The Islamic society is your society. You basically don't leave your house if it's dirty. No, you clean your house if it's dirty. You don't expect someone else to come in and clean it for you. And that's the same thing. And that's the same thing in where if you think the Muslims are not doing enough for dawah, go ahead and do it. Show us what we need to do. If you think that we're not doing the job right, go ahead. Don't, if you feel that you're part of the mu'mineen, advance it. And it's... La ilaha illallah. wal irjaf. Takhdeer wal irjaf is basically a common, a common thing that they would do. Takhdeer. Basically to make you step back so they'll be part of this activity and they'll be like oh um you know i don't think this is gonna work um it looks like we're just gonna be failures oh it's um it, you know we didn't really get to a successful level whatever activity that you would do it's always that mm, it's not gonna work out it's or it's your fault you guys just have the worst marketing you just have the worst uh, method your administration is a failure your people are a failure every single one of you is just not doing the job right and they'll basically just do this form of in trying to basically make you lose your your confidence trying to basically keep you behind and regress um and make you regress basically because they just don't want you to be successful there this is just the constant behavior of theirs Nura, i know in your mind you're 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 like oh my god did i see this a lot Nura's, Nura, i i can see you Nura. don't worry I, you know for those that don't know, 
Noura and I have been working together for oh, almost 18 years now, Noura, if you don't, 18 years, Noura. SubhanAllah. Yeah. And we've Time seen flies. Things, right, Noura? No, I mean, um, you know, it's just, uh, I know what you're talking about. Like they would, they would just be like going to the masjid, you know, criticizing. Why mm -hmm. don't they do this? Why don't they do that? Why is this the? You know, it's like a constant negativity about about just everything that Muslims are trying to do. You know. Yeah, absolutely. It really wants. It really makes me want to cry because, um, you know, it, it's it's so hard sometimes. It's so hard when you're actually doing the activity and you're finding all this negativity and they're just, you know, that this A right there, you know, nailed it. Um, where was it? We just read it earlier. If they were to go out with you, they would just really, here it is, this A. Um, if they were to go out with you, they would just get you regress into regression and they'll just basically go put in a division amongst you. They just, they're just seeking that you basically not be successful. So, and here it is, it says, you know, it, it, and here's the, the truth of the matter is that sometimes their words can influence us. Their words, they can get us slower in our activism because their words, you know, at the end of the day, we're human beings. We're trying to get things done and these people are there, you know, and you're just, you know, we're crying. It's like, well, I'm trying to do my best, putting in all the time. I did all what I know about marketing. I did what I can do and, and you know, the activism and I used the resources, but I guess if tawfiq is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what can we do? That's it. That's it. But, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, you know. Don't give them a listening ear. Keep, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will be the one to judge your intention, will be the one to judge the activism. And it's not about it's not about how many people were were uh, were, were there. You'll find certain events. Having 10,000 people and 20 and 30 and 40,000 people. And what they were really trying to get is really the business of it. And you'll find other areas where there are, there are real scholars. You know, you would go to some of these drus, like the, some of the scholars in Minnesota. We've got, we actually, have, we're so blessed in Minnesota um, to have uh, a number of different great scholars, really. But then you go to those scholars' drus, there's barely anyone there. Literally barely anyone there. Seven, eight people, 10 people. Sometimes, sometimes the classes are canceled because no one is there. And these are great scholars. Believe it or not, these are great scholars. The greatest scholars in hadith, the greatest scholars in, in qira'at, the greatest scholars in refuting the misconceptions, etc. But then we're the people to, to cherish their, um, and appreciate the ilm that they have. Allah um, Let's see, um, other things to say about the munafiqeen. Uh, they won't be there for Salat al-Jama'ah, all right? Uh, they would, or even when there is an Islamic activity. So let's see. وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنَا وَمَا يَتَخَلَّفُ عَنْهَا إِلَّا مُنَافِقٌ مَعْلُومٌ نِفَعٌ Allah Masood said, whoever wants to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muslim, whoever wants to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muslim tomorrow, that is, in other words, Ghadan Muslim on Judgment Day, um, then let them hold on to these prayers whenever they're called. That is congregation. And he said, we only had seen those that were known to actually having hypocrisy and nifaq in their hearts are the only ones to not join them on the prayer. Let's see in their day-to-day -day life, there's always this al-bada'a wal bayan. What is al-bada'a? Al-bada'a is profanity. 
And when they speak, they're always using these words and profanity. I absolutely, absolutely get disgusted and hate words of profanity. What is profanity? So whether in fresh fil kalam, fresh fil kalam, and we're you know using all these words, these bad words, and think that. <clears throat> by using these bad words that the person is, I don't know, they're thinking that it makes you cool, strong, et cetera. I absolutely hate it, but I absolutely cannot handle it. And it's, 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 it's so shameful. I mean, I would get a lot of Muslims, I got a lot of Muslims at many times, you know, when they would even, you know, call to seek a fatwa, et cetera, and don't even respect, I mean, don't even respect and where they would, I would have to constantly say, please don't use these words and, you know, constantly ask them not to use the words of profanity. It's like, you're asking a question. I hope you recognize and I hope you respect at least not necessarily me, but respect that you're seeking a fatwa. Respect that you're amongst Muslims respect that you're in a masjid, respect you know, such words, respect that you're Muslim. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Laysa al-mu'min bitta'an wa lalla'an wa lal-fahash wa lal-badeed. The Prophet ﷺ said, a believer is not a person that's constantly damning things. Laysa al-mu'min bitta'an wa lalla'an. And is not uh, basically, ta'an is basically where a person there constantly just um, speaking of negativity. Well, al fahish or al fuhsh is basically speaking of things that are supposed to be private. Okay. Um, speaking using a language that is um, many times it would be slang and using a language that is too descriptive for a certain behavior or for a certain disgusting thing, that's in fush. Il badaa would really be along the lines of that. Whether it's speaking of personal things and, and speaking about it in a way where you're very descriptive. And Allah understand, yeah, th these are just some of the the things alone stand. Sorry about that, everybody. We went into certain details, but I thought it was important. You know, we have to be patient and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Rabbi, not make us amongst the munafiqi and make us amongst the mu'mini and grant us, Ya Rabbi, grant us during these days of Ramadan and even after Ramadan and while we're during Ramadan making this dua, grant us um, steadfastness. Um, grant us iman and take away every single description of nifaq, every single description of hypocrisy and make us amongst those that would always gather in good, gather in learning our deen and gather not only virtually but gather in real life and even on judgment day near al kabthar and in Jannah. Allahumma amin. We'll end right here, inshallah. And tomorrow, we're still continuing. Okay, we're learning our deen. Um, we'll, inshallah, continue these ayat. Let me see. These ayat. So we pretty much actually went over all of these, but we're going to, inshallah, just kind of recap, inshallah, tomorrow. And we're going to continue. So we're actually doing a good job, alhamdulillah. I like this actually happening every day because we don't lose track of the notes in what, what, whatever was said the previous day or the previous class. So, inshallah, we'll see you tomorrow. Any questions? Do you want to stop the recording? or? Yeah, sure. Oh, I think.